Hey church, quick word on one of those highlights, Bethlehem again. As you may have seen in one of my pastoral short videos, Bethlehem again is our Advent giving campaign. This year it's gonna to go towards Corona Rehema in 2021, when we wanna to continue to help those in our church who are in need, especially because of the pandemic. And so in this Advent season with Bethlehem again, we're looking to raise 1.2 million shillings. So far, since we kicked off the campaign, we've only raised about 70,000 shillings. So just around 6% of that total amount. So if you're thinking about it, if you haven't thought about it, let me encourage you to step up and give generously if you're able. With all of the households in our church, it breaks down to around 6,000 shillings per household. For some of you, that's really hard, and you may even be getting helped by Corona Rehema now and in the future. But for some, you can give even beyond that 6,000 shillings per household. So please do think about how you can give generously to help us reach that goal and help those in need. But also church, as we look at towards the end of the year, our normal operating budget is about 1.4 million shillings in deficit. So if you're someone who normally gives your offerings, if you think of it as tithes, if you give that in December, I wanna encourage you to be intentional, intentional to be thoughtful, uh, to please do come through with that giving because we wanna finish the year in the black. We wanna start off 2021 strong and trust God for where he's taken us to live out our vision, our mission as a church. So thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the way that you've been giving so far this year, but let's do try to step up as a church as we close out this year. Thank you. Hi church, I hope you're well. My name is Juliet and I will be doing the third Advent lighting. Today, we light the candle of hope, the candle of peace, and the rose candle, the candle of joy. This candle is also known as the Mary candle. Mary demonstrates for us the grace, humility, and determination of the woman who carried the incarnate joy of the world, Christ Jesus. Mary reminds us that we too carry the same joy in our lives as we live in a world that lifts up the powerful over the lowly, the prideful over the humble, and the strong over the weak. As we light this candle of joy, we acknowledge how hard it is to feel joy this year. We acknowledge Mary as a teacher of how to carry the weight of the world on her shoulders. We acknowledge our shared joy of Christ within us as we continue our journey of Advent. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 9, 6 to 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of joy that is found in Christ Jesus. Remind us of this incarnate joy within us as we enter into another week ahead. Amen. Uh, good morning, RVC. Uh, my name is Joshua, and one of, I'm one of the pastors here. And I consider it uh, quite a privilege to share God's word with us this morning. My task today is to share from Isaiah uh, chapter 11, from verse 1 to 10. And my hope is that you are going to see this king, this King Jesus, uh, who's from the 
tribe of um, who is from the Davidic line. And um, please allow me to pray. Then we're just going to dig right in. God, we are grateful for your word. As we share your word this morning, we pray that, Lord, your word will transform us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness so that, so, so that Lord, we can be thoroughly equipped for your good work. As we hang out in Isaiah chapter 11, we pray that, Lord, we'll be filled with awe of who you are. The Lord, our hearts will melt at the feet of this King as we praise him and give all the glory to him. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever hoped for something to happen? Uh, something that you have been longing to get? It can be probably have gone through a series of dark parts. Uh, probably have been looking for a job for a very long time and it has not come through. Uh, probably have been looking for a baby uh, for the longest time and the Lord has not gifted you with one yet and you are longing to have this baby. Or probably in this pandemic, I know a lot of people, we are waiting for the vaccine. Um, I've heard that there is a vaccine that is already out, but I do not work with uh, the World Health Organization, so I'm not sure and I cannot verify that detail. But we are hoping that indeed a vaccine will come out and people will be treated and be healed from this COVID. So the people Isaiah is writing to, and these are Israelites, this is Judah, and they are longing for something, okay? And he's writing to them with a message of hope. Uh, even in the midst of judgment, he's writing to them with a message of hope that there is someone who is coming, a greater king, a better empire, a better savior. And so Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 3 says this, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, for the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the Lord. So the first thing we're going to look at in this chapter is the character of this king. First, Isaiah begins by saying that there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. So when we read Isaiah chapter 10, we are devastated when God is saying he's going to judge the Israelite and is going to turn the tables on the Assyrians. He's going to chop them, chop them down to the ground. Then Isaiah chapter 11, in the midst of these dead stumps, Isaiah is writing, he is prophesying, and he's saying that in those days of the blasted and ruined stem of the stock of Jesse, that a, a, a shoot will sprout forth. And God is sovereign over all nations. We know God uses nations in his sovereignty as a blessing to the children of Israel, but also sometimes he uses these nations as agents of judgment for his own glory and for his own purposes. But ultimately, God's purpose for Israel was that Israel was going to be a blessing to the nations, that through Israel, the nations, or rather the entire humanity will know this king. So the Assyrians were a dominant power for almost a century and a half. But Isaiah the prophet writes and say, in the hands of God, they're just a mere stick in the hands of a mighty God. So Isaiah writes a message of hope to Judah. And he says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. The reference to a humble Jesse rather than a glorious David, I believe is basically trying to stress God's grace in providing a deliverer from a lowly family. He's prophesying that this Assyrian empire would fall and God is going to replace it with a greater empire. And that is the empire of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. So Isaiah is prophesying that there'll be an heir from the line of the stamp of Jesse. And this is a fulfillment of actually 2 Samuel chapter 7, that a descendant will come from the line of David, that a descendant of David will rule over the house of Israel. And so God is a promise-keeping God and is actually fulfilling this promise. And we know he did because our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ 
came in this earth as a savior. And that's why we are about to celebrate the first advent on the December 25th because Jesus came, God incarnate came to this world to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And so the king, this Jesus, was coming to deliver Judah from a greater enemy. And that was sin. And that was their sins. Even though for them they expected him to deliver them from their oppressors. But Jesus was coming to deliver them from their greater enemy. From a greater bondage. And that is sin. And so the character of this king. This king is perfectly endowed by the spirit with everything he needs for his kingly tasks. It says that, um, that the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Do you remember in Luke chapter 4, Jesus opening the scrolls and say that the spirit of the Lord is upon me? That is the same concept here, that the spirit of the Lord shall be upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. So this Jesus is led by the Spirit. He's not, he does not have a false spirit or a deceiving spirit or even the spirit of a man. But rather he has the Spirit of the Lord God of Israel who rests upon him. He has the Spirit of wisdom. Jesus is perfectly wise in all things. He showed it he showed it to us in his earthly ministry and he shows it now in his ministry towards us in heaven. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 says that Jesus became for us wisdom from God. So Jesus does not just have wisdom, he is wisdom. So he is a perfect counselor because he is full of wisdom and he is also full of understanding. So that means he can give perfect counsel. And that's why friends, that's why church, that's why believer, can you lean on the whole counsel of God through the scriptures? Can you dwell with him? Can you spend time to delve into his word and know him and know his counsel, which is good, pleasing and perfect for you? And so it's not only a perfect counselor, but the spirit of might is upon this Jesus. He has the power to do what he desires. Can you imagine having a king that has no power? The reason why we need kings that are powerful is so that they can execute power, also that they can exercise their power, so that they can call the shots. So Jesus is a king who has love and might to help us. And then Isaiah goes ahead and says that the spirit of knowledge is upon him. He knows everything. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows our hearts. He knows all facts. There's nothing in this world that Jesus does not know. Jesus has the knowledge that we don't have. We know Colossians chapter 1 uh, from verse 15. It says that Jesus has authority over all things, whether visible or invisible, whether dominions or um, thrones. He's in charge of everything. He's supreme over all things, that all things were created for him and by him. And so that is the Jesus that Isaiah is prophesying today that is coming from the shoot of Jesse. He knows our hearts. And so, Brothers and sisters, we can rest in the assurance of this king that everything is safe in his hands. And then Isaiah writes, And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He will willingly, and he willingly kept himself in a place of submission to our God. He submitted to God the Father. He respected him and honored him. He came to do with the will of the Father. In the Gospels, Jesus kept reiterating that he came to do the will of the one who sent him. Jesus sent him so that he can, God sent Jesus, his son, so that he can reconcile us to himself. And Jesus came and lived a perfect life and live a life in obedience. Philippians says, Philippians chapter 2, that he lived a life of obedience even to the point of death on the cross. Even though he was in a form, God he did not consider it something to be grasped, but he humbled himself. And so Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He delighted in the fear of the Lord. His main aim was to do what the Father had told him to do. 
And so do you delight in this Jesus? Do you delight in the fear of the Lord? Dear saint or Christian, do you pursue holiness with every fiber of your being? Do you long to have communion with him? Can we say like the psalmist, as the deer parted for, parted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Do you desire to follow this Jesus? And one thing probably we can do this week, if you forget anything, one thing is, can you take time to delight in the Lord? Can you take time and spend time with him to do your devotions, to spend time with our Savior and our Master? And this is not just in a legalistic way, but rather out of the love that you have for him and what he has done for you by sending his son Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross. Out of the love that you have for him, for what he has done for us, then can you devote yourself to love him through reading of scriptures and prayer. This, and so we have looked at the character of the king, but this king, because of his character, he's going to judge righteously. Verse 3 says, He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So this king will come to judge righteously. He will come to judge righteously because he is a just, righteous, and holy king. He does not judge based on external examination. He is not limited like us that we judge based on outward appearances. Our king can read right through the hearts of men. He is the judge who will never need a witness or a counter argument. Because he has the ability to see right through our issues. He has the ability to see right through our weaknesses and our afflictions. And this judge, this Jesus, he is going to judge righteously. So, for those of us who long for divine righteousness and justice, be rest assured that that day is coming. That our king is coming when he will judge justly. He will execute his justice and equity by the power of his word. He will judge perfectly because he is perfect and he is a faithful king. It was very hard for the poor to find justice in the ancient days because they did not have influence or they, could, they did not have enough money to bribe judges. To bribe judges. However, this Messiah will do it right for the poor and be fair with the afflicted. And like some of our judges in this fallen world, his judgment will be right and his judgment will result in the death of the wicked rather than giving them preferential treatment. So Christians who have been afflicted either by suffering or diseases, Christians who are going through a lot of, 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 of pain in this world can you be encouraged that jesus is coming for those who are afflicted for those who are pressed and humble that those are the people that the lord will bless god's judgment will be just and it will be once and for all we'll have no need to visit the courts every time and again because he's going to do it once and for all everyone will receive what they deserve because our king is full of the spirit, he will be able to discern the truth and will not be tricked by false testimonies. He will be the perfect righteous judge. Oh, Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come. Friends, we are living in a world of police brutality, emotional abuse. Children are not, are not in a position to access basic um, education because of the corruption of the government. People using their powers to oppress others. But we know one day that our hope is in our righteous judge. Even though, in a sense, sometimes we get justice in this world because of the government institutions which God has placed in our midst to exercise justice, we are fully aware 
that some of these institutions are mad with sin and corruption due to the depravity of man. But, oh dear saint, there comes one who will judge righteously. He is coming to judge. He will come to judge, and he will come to judge righteously. He is the Alpha, the Omega, in the beginning and the end. And all things were created for him and by him, and is going to judge righteously. So, the righteous ones who are oppressed we will be vindicated, and the wicked will be killed. Acts 17.31 says, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man who he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. This should make us fall down at the feet of this Jesus and worship him and delight in him. So this judge will also exercise righteousness in a very peaceful way. His kingdom will be full of peace. And that is what we are going to see from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. It says that the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the wind child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples of him, shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Something different is happening here. Just the way in Genesis chapter 3, through Adam, sin affected not only humanity but the world. We know also through the second coming of our Lord and Jesus Christ, that Jesus is going to affect nature. He's going to affect humanity and the world. And he has already affected humanity in the first coming, in his first advent, because we know that through Jesus coming on the cross, we have been given a new disposition. Now we can desire to obey God's word. Now we have a spirit, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in us so that we can obey the scriptures. And so Jesus has already begun to effect this change, but He's going to do that completely once and for all in his second advent when he comes back as a judge and a king. We know that the creation, Romans chapter 8 says, the creation waits eagerly in expectation for the children of God. That the creation right now has been subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the one who has subjected it in the hope that creation itself will be liberated. And so when Jesus comes, indeed the creation will be liberated. And that's why there'll be such a peace where the cow and the bear shall graze together, where the child shall play over the hole of the cobra. The fellowship between humans and animals will be restored just like the beginning, just like in the Garden of Eden. There's going to be harmony in creation. Things that hurt people or destructive forces will be eradicated. The devil will be subdued. Our Jesus, our King will be seated on the throne. In the new heavens and the new earth, the animals will be remade with new natures. They will protect rather than devour us. There will be a different kind of tranquility. The Prince of Peace will be fully in charge. The Prince of Peace will be on the throne. He's, seen on, he's still on the throne even at this moment exercising rule on this world. But we know one day he's coming for full redemption. He's coming to completely redeem us and his creation. So the earth shall be full of the knowledge of God. The earth will no longer be suppressed by sin. The earth will be, will be groaning no more. 
the return of the knowledge of God will bring healing to humanity, but also healing to his creation. The spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord will fill the earth. Can you imagine that for a second? That the spirit of the knowledge of God will fill the earth. That will be such a good day where there'll be peace, where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more COVID, no more deaths. The rule of this king will be characterized by security and safety. The reason why we vote kings who are powerful is so that we can have security and safety. So that we can feel safe in our homes at night and or even during the day. We know we cannot fully get that in this world right now. But people, saints, brothers and sisters, in the new heavens and the new earth, when our king has come for the second time, the world we will be able to control the world things, will be able to exercise effective leadership over them. There'll be safety and security. Just imagine your wife who is so scared of insects or bugs that he will fear lions no more. He will fear bugs no more. He'll not be calling you anymore to help uh, kill, an, kill a cockroach or something. That he will be completely safe in the hands of the Lord. For you who probably every post-election violence that happens in this country you are always living in fear. And even for us Kenyans right now, even as we look at 2022, we are living in fear because we don't know what the future has for us. Can we rest in the hope of the Lord? That one, that the Lord is in control and that all events, that both kings and queens are from the Lord, that it is the Lord who gives us these kings. But secondly, can we live in the hope of the future? But there comes a time where there will be no more fear, where we'll have security and safety because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be seated on the throne and providing safety and security for us. Just imagine your child playing with wild animals. I know there are people who do not necessarily believe in the new heavens and the new earth, but the Bible is very clear. The Bible is very explicit that indeed there'll be new heavens and new earth, that our future Messiah is coming to reign on this earth. Then verse 8 it says, Nursing child shall play over the hall of the cobra, and the wind child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Friends, in those days, we shall say, O oh, death, where is your sting? Or oh, death, where is your victory? Because our Savior, our King would have won it all. He would have defeated it all. We know Jesus has already defeated death and sin. That when we believe in him, he has delivered us. He has redeemed us from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And one day he will redeem us or he will save us from the very presence of sin. If you have never trusted in this king, if you have never trusted in this Jesus, he came to this world to die for our sins. And so when we place our eyes on him and turn from our sins or iniquities and confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that he came to die for us, he does save us. He says he will and he gives us internal life and he gives us the indwelling Holy Spirit to transform us into his very image. So that even as he work our salvation with fear and trembling, he works in us, God works in us according to his purpose. And he who is faithful, he who began this work in us is faithful to bring us, to bring it to a completion. So when this king comes, we will not fear what is fatal now. The serpent will have been subdued. Devil will have been subdued. One of the questions I love to ask people is what is your greatest fear? The common response that I get is fear of the future. But this is what, these are always my two responses. If you are an unbeliever, I think your greatest fear should be 
falling in the hands of a wrathful God. But if you are a believer, then fear no more because you're in the hands of a loving sovereign father who loves you and takes care of you. The future is more promising than ever. Our future is going to be peaceful and glorious because the Bible says when he appears in glory, we will appear with him. We will know him for who he is. We will see our savior and our king and bask in his glory and rejoice, O oh, hail the king of Israel. O oh, hail our king, the king of the world is here. Christ's kingdom has come and Christ's kingdom is yet to come in a sense that one day he will come and fully exercise authority in this world. And then the last verse, which is verse 10, says, In that day the writ of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Do you remember in the first um, verse it says, the shoot of Jesse. Basically, the author is trying to show Jesus' humanity. But in the, in the last verse, it says, the root of Jesse. Basically, it means that Jesus is the source of the Davidic line. And so this particular, verse, this particular verse shows the deity of Christ. And the first verse shows the humanity of Christ, the human lineage of Christ. And so, friends, this king is God. He's truly God and truly man. And he came and died for us. And he is risen. Even as we celebrate his first advent, his, him coming as God incarnate, we know that he came so that he can die. And he is risen. And we can trust in him. And we can lean on him as believers. So the day of the Lord brings judgment on the godless. But blessings and salvation to the godly. You who are, who are here, and you have not believed in Jesus, can you believe in him today? And if you're a believer, can you lean on him and continue trusting him with your life in your day-to-day -day activities as a believer? Can you delight in the fear of the Lord? Can you live in submission, honor, and respect to God the Father who loved you so much that while you are still a sinner, Christ came and died for you? Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word. We pray that, Lord, we will delight in you. That, Lord, we will love you and fear you. That, Lord, we will desire to know you more. And for those who don't know you, we pray that, Lord, through your spirit, that, Lord, you're going to draw them to yourself. So, Father, we pray, draw them to yourself even as they hear the preaching of the gospel. The Lord, they'll be drawn to you. The Lord, you will re regen regenerate them. And for us who are believers, sanctify us with the truth because your word is truth. We bless you and we exalt you for the gift or for the means of grace of the gospel, for the opportunity to sit down at your feet and learn from you, our King and our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I know probably you'll not be in a position to gather as a church, but we love you, um, LVC, everyone who comes to LVC, and we are praying for you um, as pastors and as staff members. Thank you. Mm -hmm.